Good evening, everyone. I think we'll start with the I'm afraid you'll have to occupy every chair because we don't have any more. My name is Lucy Handley. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the library. This is the first event of our scholarly series, AI, Ready or Not. There are some brochures on the table if you're interested. I'll get some more. Dr. John R. Patrick is president of Attitude LLC and former vice president for internet technology at IBM. One of the leading internet visionaries, John's a well-known international lecturer and has been quoted frequently in the global media. Business 2.0 named him one of the 25 most intriguing minds of the new economy. John has published seven books. I think he has a new one. Um, John was a co-founder member of the World Wide Web Consortium at MIT in 1994 a founding member and past chairman of the Global Internet Project, a member of the Internet Society and the American College of Healthcare Executives, a senior member of the Association for Computing Machinery, and a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He's a member of New Vance Health Digital Patient Experience Executive Committee and a member of the board of Anne's Place. John holds degrees in electrical engineering, management, law, and health administration. He lives in Danbury, Connecticut, in Palm Coast, Florida, with his wife, Joanne. John and Joanne lived in Ridgefield for more than 30 years, and they've been philanthropic supporters of numerous local nonprofits. If you'd like to know more about John, his website is johnpatrick.com. Welcome, Dr. Patrick. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's always nice to be at the Ridgefield Library. What a great place. And I'm so happy that they're sponsoring this lecture series about artificial intelligence. And I'm proud to be the first in that lecture series. And I hope I plant some seeds with you for maybe questions for future speakers that will be here on this topic. Well, let me first, if you don't mind, I'd like to make reference to my blog. The reason I'm doing that first is because I always forget it at the end. <laughs> and later somebody says, oh, I didn't know about that. So johnpatrick.com is where you'll find all my books and also my blog. And I write a, a weekly newsletter. It goes out to about 1,100 people. And people seem to like it. A lot of different topics. So I try to make things easy to understand for the layperson, but uh, often very complex topics, I dumb them down and make sense out of them. So, I'd like to warm us up on the subject of AI by showing you a video. This video has to do with, oh. <laughs> I didn't think of that. My <laughs> brain, that must be it. So that is, uh, that's quite a robot. It's called an Atlas. And it's developed by a company called Boston Dynamics. And there's a person who started that named Mark Graber. And Mark was a professor at MIT. And he is the world's expert on how body joints work. And we take it for granted, of course, except when they hurt. But when it comes to trying to reproduce the actions that we take as humans and enable a robot to work the same way, uh, it's quite an extraordinary task. And they've been working on this for decades 
And now they have this amazing critter here and, and quite a few others. So just imagine if this robot had advanced artificial intelligence. In addition to physical dexterity, if this, these robots were, let's say, smarter than humans. Some people worry that robots are, in fact, going to be thinking about humans. They're going to be looking back over the centuries and seeing how many species we have eliminated as humans. And they might scratch their head and say, did we really need these humans? And that's the worry. Some people think it's not worth worrying about, but others are, frankly, horrified. So let's get into the topic of artificial intelligence. To put it in perspective, I'd like to reach back to December 16, 1994. I remember that date because of two things. One was the meeting, and the other was that was Joanne and my anniversary. And at this meeting, a handful of us started the World Wide Web Consortium, which wasn't the beginning of the internet, but it was the beginning of trying to develop standards that made the World Wide Web easy to use. I'm sure you don't recall, but back in the beginning of the web, it really couldn't do very much. And so this group at MIT developed standards for how to in include colors and shapes and tables and formats and documents and video and audio and all the things that we take for granted now. And when I think back about that, that day, about what is, how big of a thing is this going to be, and I have no doubt. This is, this is it. This is the future. Everything's going to be on the internet. And my employer, IBM, they weren't so sure because they saw it as a threat because of proprietary software that they made a billion or so per year on. And getting that replaced by free internet software was not appealing. But I was sure. I had no doubt. And now I think back about that. That day and that vision about the web is nothing compared to what's in front of us with AI. In other words, I'm saying AI is going to dwarf everything that we've seen with the internet. I wrote a book about this called Robot Attitude, how robots and artificial intelligence will make our lives better. And in this book, I give a lot of examples of how AI can be used in healthcare, in banking, in finance, insurance, and manufacturing, and many other areas. So if you're interested, you might want to take a look at it. This book is available in print, hardback, paperback, Kindle, of course, uh, and also Audible. So why is the rage going on right now? Why is it that every source of news today is talking about AI? It's, it's like it exploded. Why did this happen all of a sudden? AI has been around since 1950, 1955. They were actually using AI, not like today's, but they were actually using AI in the 50s, so it's not new. But what is new are these six factors that I believe has caused this tremendous explosion that we're seeing. First is awesome computer power. And there's a company called NVIDIA. Some of you may have been lucky enough to invest in it. It's currently valued at $1.1 trillion in market capitalization. And they make a chip that is specifically designed for really computer intensive things like games, for example, and also, of course, artificial intelligence. And they cannot right now meet the demand. Everybody wants these chips to be able to create their own artificial intelligence. The second reason is that the internet has become reliable most of the time, if, if you turn the Wi-Fi on. Uh, and it's also very fast, very fast. Uh, back in 1994, it worked, but boy was it slow. Now, pretty much everybody has access to really high speed, and people that are developing AI have extraordinarily fast internet connections. The third reason is the storage available in the cloud. And it's basically infinite in capacity and marginally free. And it's not really free, but the incremental cost to add a little bit more is pretty close to zero. The fourth reason is 
super smart computer scientists, kids, who were getting out of school, Carnegie Mellon and MIT and so many other great universities around the world. And what do they want to work on? AI. And number five is startup companies. An estimate currently puts it at 8,000 companies that are working on AI. They have a new idea to, for AI to do this or to do that or a new way to deploy it. And it's kind of everywhere. It reminds me, again, back in 1995, when some new software came available called Java. And I'm sure you've heard of it. And when Java became available, all of a sudden, every startup company said, oh, yeah, we have Java, whether they did or not. But we at least had plans for Java. And this is what we see right now with startup companies. All companies are saying, yeah, oh, yeah, we're, we have an AI strategy. Just you know, stay tuned. We're working on it. The size of this potential for the AI software and services, wide-ranging estimates, but let's say one and a half trillion, it's probably a lot more than that. Now, AI has, there's a lot of term, terminology, and some of them overlap, some of them are more important than others, but these are the ones that are let's say, uh, uh, most important. Machine learning, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Neural networks, neural as in what's going on in our brains. Deep learning, which is another variation on that. Natural language processing, where an AI not only can understand the words we say, but the meaning of those words. And if you say this word, it's very likely, highly probable, that the next word is going to be this other one. Computer vision goes without saying, robotics, as you just saw, self-driving cars. Some people believe, including me, that the largest AI purveyor right now is Tesla. They're capturing an extraordinary amount of data. Every time I get in my car and drive somewhere, they know where I am. It's anonymous, but they are ca capturing this data so that they can improve you know, the accuracy of full self-driving where you just get in the car and say, take me to such and such a place, and it takes you there uh, error-free, in theory. Uh, <laughs> robotic process automation, I mentioned this because it's becoming very, very important. RPA is it's software, but it's not a physical robot, but it sort of is like a robot in the sense that it automates tasks. And if you look at all the tasks that are going on around the world. And you look at how many of them are basically paper pushing tasks. One estimate shows that there will be 200 million people who will, whose job will be taken over by RPAs. That's just in the banking sector. So it's going to be very, very important. And then there are, of course, the virtual assistants, Alexa, Siri, and the various chatbots like chat the GPT, Bard, my favorite, and there's many, many others. Okay, what are the pluses and minuses of AI? Well, there are plenty of both. The pluses are that robots with AI can do jobs which are difficult, dangerous, or boring. There's a lot of jobs in that category. How would you like to have the task to go inside the plant at Fukushima, uh, Japan, and check on how things are going? Robots don't care. They're happy to do it. Uh, improved healthcare outcomes, and I'll have some more to say about that. Uh, collaboration. Used properly, AI will actually help us learn more. It will help humans become smarter. And boost productivity, greater efficiency. So there's a lot of pluses, and that's just a, a really short list, and I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, of course, there are minuses. It makes mistakes. You ask in a, a chat GPT or BARD or any of the other uh, AI chatbots, you ask them a question, don't assume that the answer they give you is correct. Most of the time it will be, but not always. So this is why when people say, oh, you know, uh, AI, we can give it the, uh, the metrics of, of a patient and have the AI give the diagnosis. Well, yeah, they can do that, 
but I don't think we want to depend on that with no human involvement, for sure. So there are mistakes, and there also is bias. This is a big problem. Why is there bias? Well, who creates AI? Humans. Most humans have some form of bias, and so it finds its way into the AI. And over time, this can become more serious. Uh, it definitely can eliminate millions of jobs. Right now, it's creating jobs. I remember in 1994, five, yeah, 95, I was chairman of the Global Internet Project. And it was a big concern that the internet was going to take away jobs. And when people saw how powerful it was, they said, oh, boy, this is going to eliminate a lot of jobs. So we hired a consultant to come in and do a study on this. And he came back and said that the internet so far, since 1995, has created one million net positive jobs that didn't exist before. And certainly today, when you look at Airbnb and Amazon and Google and you know all these internet companies, they, they employ millions and millions of people. So right now, AI is creating jobs. But over time, no question, there are a lot of jobs that are going to be eliminated. Which brings up issues about uh, guaranteed basic income and retraining, and there's a lot of those associated issues that go along with that can spread misinformation. This is happening right now. And the reason it's happening is because the AI models basically scoop up everything that's on the internet and use that as the basis to answer our questions. Well, we all know there's a lot of things on the internet that are inaccurate, a lot. And so we have to be really careful here. And nobody knows exactly how to differentiate good information, correct information, from misinformation. It's a very controversial topic. And more of a concern is deep fakes. Deep fakes is when an AI creates or modifies the video of a person to make that person sound like some other person, using the words of a different person, but with the voice of the person that they're showing. And how do you know what to believe? Did he really say that? My congressman said that? Well, no, the congressman didn't say that. But AI was used to train a video to make that congressman video say something that somebody else wanted to have uh, been said. There was a great, funny video of Queen Elizabeth. I was going to show it to you, and I tried to find it, and apparently the folks in, in Britain found a way to erase it. <laughs> it was a hilarious video where the Queen was giving out messages about the holidays. It looked like the Queen. It sounded like the Queen, but it wasn't the Queen. And at first, you were sure that it, yeah, that's the Queen. But then she started cracking jokes. <laughs> and people were laughing. Oh, boy, I didn't know the Queen had such a good sense of humor. <laughs> and then as it went on and on and on, the final part of her little presentation when she was dancing the jig. And then everybody knew. There's no way that that's the queen. Looks like the queen, sounds like the queen, not the queen. I saw in, in an issue of some uh, online newsletter that showed Elon Musk, chairman of Tesla, and Mar Mary Barra, the uh, CEO of General Motors, walking down the street holding hands. And needless to say, they're not the best of friends. Uh, it, was, it was fake. It was a deep fake. We're going to be flooded with deep fakes between now and the November elections. We're going to be flooded with them. And you won't know what to believe. So what do we do about that? Well, more on that in a moment. And then there's the, the potential threat to humanity. Is this threat real? Yeah, it, it, it is real. Is it going to happen? Are we going to get wiped out by AIs and robots? I don't think so, but it's possible if we don't take the right steps along the way. AI is what we think of today as something incredibly smart, but then there's going to be ASI, artificial super intelligence, and AGI, artificial general intelligence. And AGI essentially means that it's when 
the AI has become smarter than we are. And how are they going to feel? Will they feel? Will they, will they be sentient? And, well, I'm pretty sure they will be. So we definitely need uh, regulation. More on that in a moment. And then facial recognition. On you know, January 6th, there were a lot of people smashing windows and doing nasty things. A thousand or so of them are in jail right now. How did they catch up these people? Very simple. These people were taking selfies and, and videos of each other that made it very, very easy for the government to identify who they were. They just compare it to what's on Facebook and other places. And so it was helpful, I guess you could say, in, in that instance. But some governments are very afraid of this. 17 states have banned it. In my opinion, they've gone a little too far with this. It needs to be regulated, but when we say we're going to ban it, well, how about if we know that there's a particular terrorist on the loose in downtown Philadelphia? We know what that person looks like. Shouldn't we be looking for that person? Uh, I think so. So it's, again, a lot of controversy here. So a bit more about, let's go a little bit deeper about AI. The, the best way I can summarize it is to say that AI is all about data and algorithms. So an algorithm is a, basically a formula. It's scientific code which is applied to that data to try to make sense of it. Simple algorithms would be like area equals pi r squared. That's an algorithm. That's a pretty simple one. We all learned in grammar school. But they're very, very sophisticated algorithms. Millions of lines of code that, that absorb all the data from the internet and make sense of it, discover the relationships between various forms of data, and they use that as a way to uh, create new content. A bit more on that to come. But first, I'd like to give you a text. So suppose you're sitting on the bench out front of this great library on Main Street. You see a dog go by. Oh, there's a dog went by. And a little later, you look, oh, there's a cat went by. But how did you know that it was a cat? How did you know that it was a dog? Well, we just know. Now, there's a little bit more to it than that. How do we know? Well, we capture that image, and that image appears on the back of our eye, goes through the optic nerve, and ends up back here in the occipital lobe, and it goes through a series of neural networks, layer after layer after layer, that look at things such as how many legs did it have, what color was it, how far between the eyes, what shape are the ears, does it have a tail. There's dozens of parameters that you can associate with a cat or a dog. And over the years, our brains have just learned that. And it's pretty accurate, but it, computer vision is even more accurate. How did it get more accurate? Well, Google, for example, and, and others have captured these images of cats and dogs. And they trained the AI to know this was a cat. This was a dog. This was a cat. And in many cases, this is a manual process where there are human beings looking at these, at these images. Based on their experience, they know this is a cat, this is a dog. And they build up this huge database of millions of cats and dogs. <coughs> so when they <coughs> set up a camera across the street, and they look and they see this animal go by, they capture that information. And just like the human going back to the occipital loop, it goes to the cloud. And in the cloud, they have algorithms that compare what it saw with the millions of other examples. And as a result, they become more accurate than humans. This has implications in healthcare, as I'll discuss in a moment. So what we're seeing today is the emergency, the emergence of what we call large language models. The simplest example would be that an AI company scans the entire internet and collects all the content from the internet, billions, hundreds of billions of pages of information, 
and they assemble it into what's called a large language model. So now it has all this information, and it has algorithms that can build relationships among that information, so that when we ask a question, it can respond and give us an answer. It's not like Google search. Google search, you ask a question, and you get a page full of references, links. Hundreds of millions of links are produced. And you go crazy sometimes trying to figure out, you know, none of them are really exactly what I'm looking for. But when you ask an AI, chat GPT or BARD, a BARD is by Google, chat GPT is by OpenAI, a company, startup company, they just give you a paragraph, and it's instant. Almost instant. Sometimes it takes two or three seconds. And it will give you an answer to your question. And what makes it really powerful is that you can have a conversation with this AI. So you ask a question, and it gives you a, this answer, and you look at it, and then you type into the prompt, oh, that's not exactly what I meant. How about such and such? It's, oh, oh, you're right. I, I forgot that. And it gives you a bunch more information. Well, could you write a paragraph using uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking about? Oh, sure. How long do you want it to be? Oh, 500 words. OK, here it is. I got an email from a friend of mine, Mike Kolchny. Some of you probably know Mike. He runs the Makerspace, Hackerspace in Danbury. And they were having a hearing coming up about getting an exception in the, in the zoning to enable them to expand the Makerspace into the old Holiday Inn up on Old Ridge, uh, Ridgebury Road. And I said, John, could you, could you help us out here? We need a, a letter of reference. If you could write a letter saying that you support this idea, uh, the fact that you live near there and you have some reputation, I, I think it would really help. Sure, I'll get back to you. So I went to the AI, and I said, Bart, uh, please write a letter of recommendation for this hearing that's coming up. It's based on the following three things. And then I press the enter button. Zzz, out comes the letter. Dear Mayor, and it had brackets you know, to insert the mayor's name and address and so on. It said, this is a really important project coming up, and I urge you to support it. This is going to do the following. A, B, C. It was a beautiful, beautiful letter. And so I sent it to him, and he was, he was just uh, knocked off his chair. Now, was it 100% accurate? In that case, it probably was, because that, that's a simple one. But the point is that generative AI creates content based on the large language model. So you can ask any kind of a question you want. Maybe you want to write a story. Maybe you even want to write a book. And you can say, please write me a thousand word essay about electronic uh, electric vehicles, EVs, and tell me about what's going on with charging. Are there enough chargers? And you ask a few other things. A couple seconds later, you get a page full of information. You don't get a page full of links to go. You get an actual answer. And you look at it and say, well, uh, could you refine that? Uh, it's a little too complicated. Could you make it simpler? There it is. Could you shorten it? to 250 words, there it is. And when you tell it that you notice something that's wrong, and you're certain it's wrong, you call them out on it and say, you said this, but that, that's, that can't be, that's not true. That comes back and says, oh, yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> so you're, this, the role of the humans are pretty important here. You have to look at what it's telling you, and, and you know, does it make sense? So this generative AI, it, it's changing everything. You know, the writers are on strike. They may regret that. And of course, there's an issue of students doing their term papers, having an AI write the term paper. Well, there also are software tools now that can, can look at something and determine that if it was written by an AI, and this is 
a, a slight glimpse at what we need a lot more of in the form of regulation. So what's the impact? Who gets impacted by AI? And I simply say every organization, every person, and every process. That's a pretty big statement, but it's true. So I think it's pretty clear we need regulation. Asia, uh, China specifically, Europe, they've done a great job on regulation. In the US, mm, not so great. There have been three hearings, May, July, and September of, the, of this year. The first one was by, was headed up by uh, our uh, Blumenthal, Senator Blumenthal. And it was bipartisan, there was no bickering. Uh, I didn't detect any trying to gain stage uh, recognition versus others. It was, a, it was a genuine hearing, a lot of good questions. One of them, one person, one senator observed, you know, I think the genie is out of the bottle. I would just add to that, yeah, and there's going to be more genies becoming, coming out of more bottles. And the concern, of course, is the Senate moves at the snail's pace, and AI is moving at the speed of light. So yesterday, they had another hearing. This hearing was held by Senator Schumer. It was a closed-door hearing. Why would it be a closed-door hearing? These are five of the smartest people in the world who are there to talk about AI and give their opinion. Shouldn't the public hear that? I think so. Could it be that the senators recognize that their ability to understand tech is not quite the same as those five billionaires? And there's no doubt about it. Some of the questions they ask are, are idiotic. They make no sense at all. And I suspect that's the reason they made it a closed door. They didn't want to expose how little they know and how unable they are to, to deal with the answers that they hear. So what is the regulatory answer? Well, you know, back in 1995, I was chairman of this global internet project, and our task, we were a public policy group. And we traveled around the world to convince the world leaders to resist the temptation to regulate the internet. And we felt very strongly about it, and frankly, our efforts were successful. It's a good thing, because Europe was ready to regulate. And uh, we, we got that stopped. The US was clue, clueless. They really they had no idea what the internet was. Now today, I feel quite different. Today, we need regulation. And these tech, technology company executives, they're begging, begging, give us regulation. We need it. They're concerned how fast AI is, is advancing. You may have seen that there was a letter published that, that suggested that all AI companies should just put on a freeze for six months. Uh, I was one of the signers of that letter. But I, it was a joke. I knew it would have zero impact. These companies are speeding up, not slowing down. They don't want the other guy to get ahead of them. They're all going as fast as they can. So, what we need is probably a department of AI. The ideal thing would be to maybe get rid of some departments that we don't need anymore. Uh, it, but we, let's add this new one. They're much better at adding than they are at uh, removing. So I don't know. I, I got my fingers crossed that the, that the Senate will, will move on this fast. We can't wait a couple of years, which is typically how long it takes for some important new idea. Okay, I want to go yet a little deeper in one particular area, and as I said, every area of every organization is affected, but I'd like to touch on healthcare a little bit. There's a great book called The AI Revolution in Medicine. It was written by Peter Lee and a group of other people at Microsoft. Really, really excellent book. And as I think about it, I see so many opportunities. The electronic health record 
is something that pretty much all patients and all doctors have learned to hate. Nobody likes it. There's generally agreement that we need it, but nobody likes it. And the exome sequencing, the whole exome sequencing, this is genetic sequencing, is a really big deal. And some hospitals are actually, if you come in even with a sore throat, they're going to sequence your genes. This is a good thing, as long as it's kept anonymized. The Geisinger Healthcare System in Pennsylvania, for example, have implemented this policy. You walk in the door, your genes get sequenced. And they're building up this huge database, totally anonymized, but it gives them a lot of information to draw upon. Electronic health records are continuously added with more information. What happens with that information? Does it actually get used? Uh, well, some of it does, but Think what could happen if we converted all the electronic health records in New Man's Health and converted that into a large language model. Not a large language model of the entire internet, but a large language model of all the electronic health records in the hospital network. So a lot of incredible amount of data there. Again, anonymized. But just imagine what could be done to identify trends to identify emerging uh, diseases, to identify <coughs> ways of, of population health, to, to treat a population of a particular kind of cancer or, or a particular uh, congestive heart failure is a good example, where a lot of people have it, but they're not all the same. Likewise with cancer, there's, it used to be, it, you had breast cancer or prostate cancer or this cancer or that cancer. Oh, well, if you have that, then you need this drug. Well, today, that doesn't cut it. Now, today, we want to look at the, the genetic components of that tumor. And this is what where AI is going to have a really big impact. And the reason is because of the large amount of data. I'll give you another example of that in just a moment. So you think about medical errors. You know, the number one cause of, of death in America is heart disease. Number two is cancer. Number three, put COVID aside for a moment. Number three, some studies have shown that number three is hospitals. <laughs> medical errors. The numbers are debatable, but we know that there are errors. There are medications that are you know, four or five syllables long. And there's another one that looks very similar and sounds very similar, but it's different. This one has a dosage of 100 milligrams. This one has a dosage of 100 micrograms. And you give 100 milligrams to an infant, the infant dies. This happens. So AI can kind of look over our shoulder and be a co-pilot in, in a sense and help us to eliminate medical errors. Medical research will be greatly enhanced, greatly enhanced by AI. Diagnosis is a sticky area. It definitely can help, but we shouldn't expect to just ask for a diagnosis and get it and apply a, a script to treat that particular diagnosis. We need significant human involvement. Physician notes. Doctors, on average, according to a recent study, spend two hours a day, mostly after they get home with their family, writing physician notes to summarize what went on with the patients they saw during the day. This is really unproductive. This is what I call low-hanging fruit. And AI solutions are now on the market. Google has one, and a number of startup companies have them, where they take the recording of the patient-doctor interaction in the office. The doctor says, uh, glad to see you. Do you mind if I turn on my iPhone? I'd like to record this conversation. Most people would say, sure. And that information, that recording, is then fed into the AI. And the AI writes the physician notes and converts it into a format which is easily importable into the electronic health record. 
this, this could save an incredible amount of hours across a million providers in the U.S. Uh, there's a lot of other paperwork. Pre-authorization. Nobody likes pre-authorization except the insurance companies. <laughs> and could that be streamlined? Of course it could be. Uh, and there's much, much more. I'll give you an example of when I keep saying a lot about data. Stethoscopes have been with us for, I forget exactly which year, but in the 1800s. And they look pretty much the same as they always have. It's a startup company that has a device where you unplug the little black tube from the device, from the stethoscope. You insert this little, little device about that big. And you plug the tube back into the bottom. And then you listen to the heart and lungs of, of the patient. And all the data that is recorded from that examination is converted to digital information. It's transmitted to an iPhone, it goes to the cloud. The cloud compares that pattern of audio with millions of other samples that have been obtained. And one study showed that a resident pulmonologist can have a more accurate diagnosis than a 40-year experienced pulmonologist. Now, some of these studies are questionable and so on, but the, the, the point is, is valid, that if you have enough data, you can't just rely on the anecdotal experience of one person, which may be very valuable, but most physicians would admit, no, my diagnoses are not 100% accurate. And so this is just one example. X-rays. Stanford published a study that showed that they set up a panel of radiologists. They took a, a sample of, of the breast cancer scans, a large number of them. And they gave them to the radiologist, and they gave them to the AI. The radiologist's accuracy was 85%, which is not so bad. The AI accuracy was 99%. Again, we always have to question what AI gives us, and we need to have that human involvement, but the potential is pretty clear. So there are a lot of exposures, there are many opportunities. What I recommend to healthcare systems is go for the low hanging fruit, go for the physician notes, look around the organization and see how many people do you have that are pushing paper. When the AI exploded here a few months ago, Arvind Krishna, the CEO of IBM, had his team do a study on this, and they, they discovered 7,000 jobs that were just not needed. They were trivial tasks. You know, move this piece of paper from this pile to that pile, and it, it uh, will be replaced by AI. So potential is great. The possibility for errors is also great. Okay, now I'd like to see what's on your mind. I know you have questions. Bob. So, so John, um, as you said, if you think AI will and, and possibly now is, in fact, affecting everybody, whether we realize it or not, uh, and hence, there is uh, obviously by those who showed up an interest in it. How would you suggest individuals who wanted to learn more about it to become involved as to more what it can do for one, for yourself? How might one use it? How would you suggest approaching that? Yeah, great question. What I would suggest is go to bard, B A R D, dot Google dot com and ask the question. Let's do that. Okay, so down here at the bottom, this is, this is called a prompt. This is a prompt. Did you know that there's a new job opening in the market for prompt engineers? <laughs> and a prompt
prompt engineer is a person that knows how to phrase the question properly to minimize the possibility of getting a wrong answer. And, well, let's, uh, let's think of a question here. Uh, how many electric cars? So there you get two simple paragraphs with the answer. Now, if you type those same words into a Google search, you would get a list of you know, 100 million links and very heavy concentration of ads. Oh, going to electric car roll, you get, we have a bargain this week, you know, click here to buy. This is what you get from Bart. Now, let's see if we find something wrong here. Uh, okay, so on the world's roads, let's see. How about in the U.S.? Conversation. And I, I talk to a lot of doctors about this, and I urge them don't just ask a question and accept it or reject it. Have a conversation. And the, the deeper that conversation goes, the more impressed you will be and the more you will learn. And the prompt is, is, is quite amazing, actually, how this technology works. So, all I said was, how about in the U.S.? Well, how does it know what, I'm, what my intention here is? Well, it knows that you have just asked something else, just like you're having a conversation with a person. So this is really, really powerful. And you can say, uh, please give me this in French, or please write a story about this uh, 500 words and make it simple, or make it more uh, legally acceptable, or anything that you can imagine. So I use BARD every day, and I think of it as my co-pilot, my partner, my helper, my assistant. And it, it's great. You know, I, I love it. It really improves productivity compared to the old way, which was to search Google. And then you, you know, that's the beginning, not the end, of getting an answer to your question. Yes, sir. Um, so the Mark language models have been updated. The last time I think you spoke, you said that they were only uh, current up to 2021. 20, 21. Okay. So how often will these models need to be updated? Because it sounds like they can be updated very, very Right. Well, the, these large language models, there are many variations on the theme. The chat GPT, which was really what lit up the, the, the flames of interest here, they created a large language model based on everything on the internet through September 2021. BARD, we're looking at here, on the other hand, is up to the minute. It's a totally different approach. It's sort of a combination of the large language model plus the current information that it would retrieve from Google search. And the real opportunity here, in, in my opinion, is specialized large language models. Large language model containing the electronic health records of all New Vance patients, for example. And every company will be looking at this to take all their customer records from uh, the customer experiences, you know, from many, many years uh, that they've been working with their customers and be able to build a large language model and then ask questions. You know, how satisfied are our customers? How many complaints did we get? What were those complaints about? And you start to think, wow, this is, I can actually get answers to those questions? And I don't have to get a team of six people to, to start a task force and, and study it to death. I can just ask my, my partner, the AI. Yes, sir. So what would be the implications of AI in the hands of militarily of bad guys, of the enemy. Yeah. 
Well, this is a, one of the things that is very scary. I'm concerned about this. When you, you saw those robots earlier, and you arm them with artificial intelligence, and you put them on the battlefield, what do you tell them to do? And at some point, with the rate of increased intelligence of these AIs, at some point they will become autonomous. And what that means is you have this robotic aircraft carrying a cruise missile, and it decides when to pull the trigger, not a human. And this is part of the regulation that we need. We need guardrails to say there's got to be limits on what AI can do. And you've got to be able to identify if, some, if a picture, if an image was created by an AI, you've got to put a stamp on it so that people can tell that that is the case. So that deep fakes can at least be identified. You know it's fake. And likewise, uh, in the military, you want to really have some level of control over that. And the military is all over it, but they're moving as fast as they can because China is. And if you, if you want to be, you know, look at uh, Doomsday, you know, we get all these robots out there fighting with each other, and, you know, it's the end of the world. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, John, I, I read some time back uh, making of the atomic bomb, and a lot of the motivation behind that was fear that somebody else, presumably Germany, potentially Japan, during World War II, right. would get there first. And I think your guardrails, I hear that, sounds well intended, but it's a little bit like, and this will be, I'm sorry if this is political and rough as feathers, it's a little bit like gun control. Let's, let's write a regulation and all the bad guys are going to observe the regulation. Um, I, I agree. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. Um, yeah, but the question is, are we better off with some attempt at creating guardrails and putting some limitations and have an auditability where the Department of AI can audit what your, what your AI is doing, just like the IRS audits the tax return you submitted? The Department of AI going to know about my computer down the basement? No, not that's, no, I don't think so. What, what they will know about is companies that produce AI software and companies that are creating large language models. And they're going to have to create some regulatory guide rails for what those large language models can do and be subject to audit. And the audit will be essential for them to be able to raise money from investors. I, I hear that, but I go back to my original yeah. question about the family phone No, I know. No, it's, you're right to be skeptical, but you know, doing nothing is, all, is much higher probability of leading, leading to a very bad outcome. In the back. <coughs> so um, thank you. Um, so maybe to be just a little bit provocative, sort of keep in this line because although you talked, I found it very interesting, I found, I got the feeling that we were avoiding the elephant in the room, which is all the sort of um, hydra-headed uh, dangers of this kind of technology. And I feel that the uh, uh, idea of regulation, although it's something that we need to look at, there's a sense of a bait and switch going on is that that might be some solution or perhaps just well the best solution that we might come up with for for what well for problems that we haven't even imagined so i'd like to just imagine for a moment some of those problems because i think that's the kind of um, discussion and thinking that we need to do as a society and as societies uh, in order to decide how we go forward with this. That it will not be just a matter of us hoping that some senators who are so ignorant that they need to have closed hearings, right, come up with some kind of regulation that we think is going to solve a problem that we haven't even sketched out yet. So I'll, I'll give you a very mundane 
example of one of the problems, or I would even say dangers, that I see of, of AI. And um, like the internet, there are the problems like the gentleman just mentioned sort of militarily, which are just very sort of black and white and, and scary, frankly. But then there are also very many insidious uh, interactions that this, these technologies will have with, our, with our, ourselves individually and also society that we also need to talk about uh, sort of again and again and again to, to, to sort of get into it and see what we're really grappling with. So here's an example. So I, I write, uh, for my uh, profession, I write scientific papers. Right? And maybe you have done that in the past too. What kind of papers? Scientific papers. Yeah. Okay. So, as, so perhaps as you know, one of the most difficult things in writing a scientific paper is the introduction, right? Because it's in the introduction where you have, to, you have to gather all of your thoughts, come up with your motivation, and create a line of thinking that's going to lead to what you already know or your conclusions. So you have to basically synthesize like you just you know, gave us examples of when you type in some question to bar or to do uh, a chat GPT or whatever. So I've been writing a paper in the last couple of weeks, and I've been working on the introduction to this paper. And what I have found is that in that process, I have deepened an understanding of what I've been doing in the last year in doing the research and creating the data and analyzing it and rediscovering the wealth of the original question that I posed a year ago in the research and then now trying to get ready to present to someone else who might like to read this paper. And in that process, I have grown and learned in a way that I could not have. You know, when you go to college, you're asked to write a, you know, a, a, a thesis paper. So it's sort of the same process. Now, last week, I read an article in the Atlantic magazine that I thought was interesting. It was engaging. I learned a few things. I really don't remember what they are now. But the process that I've gone through in grappling with and trying to write this introduction to my paper has stayed with me and deepened me and my understanding of the scientific questions that I'm interested in. So that kind of thing. If I had gone to the, the chat thing here and gotten an answer to it, I might have been satisfied with it and tinkled with it a little bit, I've done a little back and forth, but I wouldn't have gotten that deep learning that human beings do. And so that's just an example of the kind of insidious uh, temptation that these kind of technologies offer to us human beings who you know, are always looking for the easy way out. Yeah. And I think that there, in, in terms of AI, that's just one example of many, many facets to the, the trickiness of this beast that we need to explore and, and sort of not just superficially gloss over. Yeah, so. yeah well, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. You know, the, you have to think about what is your goal in using this? If the goal is plagiarism, then that's one goal. And that is the goal for a lot of people. But if your goal is to have a conversation with all the available information on a particular subject and interact with it, that can have the effect of, of what you're talking about. But in, in the process of research and trying to figure out how to write an introduction, you learn. And this can be a learning tool, as I mentioned earlier on. It's a co collaborative capability. David. With the example you gave there, you can see how it's an educational tool. But as the father of college age, more or less kids, who are turning to this more and more, I worry that it does potentially stifle their creativity. As AI goes into the art world, and the music world, and the entertainment world, and you can ask AI to create a uh, painting of them kind of rich in the style of Monet. 
what is the motivation for young people to learn how to become creative and express themselves if they can do it this way so quickly? Well, it's just, it's just a tool. And teachers have to learn how to help their students use this in a productive way which expands their, their vision. When pocket calculators came along, a lot of parents said, geez, you know, our kids are they're not going to have the arithmetic and punch some buttons. And so what you're saying is, is, is a valid concern, but as I said, every role is going to change, including teachers. And their initial reaction is shell shock. Uh, that's got to change. They have to learn more about it. They have to have, you know, spend a few hours talking with Bart or other AI and, and get uh, creative with in teaching the kids how to use this in a way that will make them smarter and more competitive and not suppress creativity. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, a simple question. What if you're concerned about the accuracy of this? Can you ask for what their sources are? Sure. And they will list the sources of where they yeah. got this. It, it, it usually provides a source. Uh, yeah. are much more specific. And it, it, that, that's, that's kind of it. Okay. You have to look at what you're getting from the AI. You, you have to be skeptical. You can't just accept it because they do make mistakes. Yes, ma'am. Since the large language models and the databases are the core of what everybody's relying on, who are the owners of those large language models and databases? Where are these new banks? Yeah. So the question is, who, who owns these LLMs? The answer is the people that created it. But there's a deeper issue that you may have had in mind underneath of that, which is if the LLM consists of all the information on the internet, a lot of that information is copyrighted. A lot of it is wrong. So who's responsible for that? And this goes back to the regulatory thing. And by the way, the, the tech executives they want to work with the government to come up with, to define these guardrails and to define things that could be audited. But as of right now, they don't, nobody, they don't have anybody to work with. But the, so the answer is, it, it, who created it owns it. But as you know, there's, they don't really own all that information, but they're acting like they do. This is part of the <laughs> regulatory thing. Yeah, in the back. Yes, you mentioned two things which uh, I, I thought were particularly important. One is AI is going to replace a lot of jobs. Right. You yourself mentioned how radiologists are not nearly as accurate as AI. So uh, in our for-profit healthcare system, it seems like a lot of radiologists might go pay for work. And to me, the big picture is this is going to exacerbate the uh, concentration of wealth in our country. We're going to have Many, many people who for, you know, do blue collar work and such will be out of work, and we have no idea what to do with that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I, I agree. It's a very, very good point. Right now, as I said, we're creating jobs. Technology companies are hiring people to, to work in this area, and companies will be hiring people to help them take advantage of AI. And so in the short term, it's going to create jobs. But in the long term, a lot of jobs are going to be eliminated. So what do you do with those people? Well, the, ideally, you retrain them into some higher level capability. So with 2 million bus drivers, truck drivers, you know, how many of them could be AI programmers? Well, some of them, uh, but not, not all of them. And so ultimately, there's going to be left over a lot of people that just could not upgrade their skills, and are they going to become a burden on society? There are experiments underway right now for guaranteed basic income. You may recall Andrew Yang ran on that particular idea when he ran for, for 
of Brisbane. And a number of the billionaire geniuses, you know, they believe ultimately that's going to be required. And both parties of our government, they don't like, they don't want to hear it. No, they, they view it as a giveaway program. And, uh, and when somebody says that to me, I say, okay, well, what's your alternative? And you know, no answer. So it's important. Yes, sir. That's the same thing that was said when uh, the automatic looms were going to displace all the home weavers. And uh, we don't, admittedly, there's a time lag here, but we don't have a lot of unemployment lines with home weavers in them. And no, the, the, the and underlying it, economy is growing. Something else to do. Yeah, it's going to be a big problem, yes, sir. Yeah, and this in the example that you gave, John, the input was the keyboard. Yeah. We were entering the letters. Can AIs also receive things like video clips? Oh, yeah. Streaming videos? Yes. And what can the AIs tell us either about that video or what can they do with it? Yeah, you can, this, you can have this conversation that I advocate uh, by talking to it. Now, if you go on this MacBook, if I just hit the function key twice, it turns on the, the recording capability. And instead of me typing it, it, it's a dictation system built into all of our devices, our, our phones and iPads and all of our devices. So uh, you can also feed it an image and say, please tell me what this image is. Or you might say, could you make an image similar to this, but with different color, or a different shape, or that connotes this other idea? Yeah, they can do it. Or, or, or a video clip, or streaming video as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the degree of sophistication and this deep fake thing is really, uh, it's astounding where you can take the video of a person who says yes, and they change the voice to say no, and they change the lips in the video, and do it pixel by pixel, and redo that video, real time. So you can have a person here that's real time, and have a person over here that's created from that, but is fake, saying something different, the same voice. This is, a, this is why one of the, the guardrail ideas is that is to use a, a stamp that every video created by an AI must be identified as a, you know, a little stamp on there and say this a, this image was created by an AI. Yeah. Let's get we got more questions back. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm thinking about the computing power yeah. keeping up with this. Do you think the demand would be exponential? They are. This is why NVIDIA is worth one point one trillion. The only way you need some hardware, not magic. Yeah, well, that's what NVIDIA does. They make the hardware. They make the chips. And they're sold out, you know, and they're expanding. And other companies are moving into it. Amazon is designing their own chips. Apple is designing their own chips. Apple's uh, iPhone 15, which starts order taking tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be first in line. Uh, it has neural networking chips built into it, and it can uh, perform the, the effect of a large language model without going to the cloud or on the device. This is why, why Apple has a big lead in, in terms of privacy compared to others. It send them, whatever you say, it sends it to the cloud. With uh, Apple, it doesn't. I think I'm, I'm wearing you out. It's been uh, a long time. I really appreciate your interest and, and attention. I hope you attend the lectures to come, the brochures in the back. And do visit johnpatrick.com. Feel free to sign up for my weekly newsletter. The story coming out Saturday comes out at 6 o'clock every Saturday morning. This Saturday morning, the story is going to be about electric vehicles and range anxiety. <laughs>